Bible's out. Let's raise the word of God high together and say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer and prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, as we turn to your holy word, we pray that you speak to us, that you open our hearts, you open our minds, you open our ears to receive what you would have us to hear and learn. Father, uh, in this lesson, uh, I'm sure there will be times of growing for all of us, maybe some convictions, but also some edification. May we take from your word today what you need us to hear to apply to our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. For the next couple of uh, Sundays, I'm going to be gone. But I have good news. I'll be back. I'm moving to Lexington Park. <laughs> and I won't be alone. I'll have my wife and my kids with me, and I'm really looking forward to that. Amen. <laughs> so, I'm going to do like pastor talk moments with you before I do my sermon for the next couple weeks. So I want you to start to hear my heart. And what I'm actually trying to do is prepare the ground, because believe it or not, I've not made any changes yet. Some of you may think, well, I've already noticed that. I really haven't. So when those things do happen, I want to make sure you know my heart. So I'm trying to prepare you. So the first thing I want to say today is I want to open up with this. I, I've, I, you know, coming in as a new guy, my eyes are critical. I'm in observation mode right now. So I'm actually telling myself, worship, just worship, just worship. Quit looking around. Quit doing this. Quit doing that. And, and I'm watching everything and everyone to see the heart of the church and to see what's going on. And, and I see every cobweb and I see every bug and I see everybody. All right? So, but I want you to know that what I've observed is this, and I want everybody to put their ears open to this. There is greatness in this room because we serve a great God. And I've already seen the things that you all have in place and the things that you're doing. I think they need to be focused, and I, need, I think there needs to be some priorities and some things like that. There's a lot of good stuff going on here. You need to believe in yourself and believe in the God who wants to bless you. So I just want, I, I hope that came off ultra, like, encouraging. What I want you to see is that I don't know why you've been in decline. I really don't. I'm watching and seeing things, and I'm thinking, I'm scratching my head. Something I'm missing, and I'm going to, but the one thing I think it is, is you just need to believe God wants to do great things. So let's start off with that. Believe in yourself. Believe that God does things. And I want you to look around. There's a lot of empty seats right now. You all have two weeks to fill them before I get back. <laughs> Amen. So June 15th, I'm expecting to show up and guess what? Fullness. Amen. Now you all are saying that it's never going to happen. I know what you're thinking already. But God is great enough to do it. That's the type of stuff we have to start believing. That's the kind of stuff we got to know that, guess what? Yes, I love the song we just sang. Even at my best, I'm unworthy. But God wants to bless us despite those things. Amen? So remember that and believe in that. And that's, that's my pastor talk for you today. And the next thing I want to say to you that I'll reiterate when my family's here. Remember, I've, I've had three weeks with you. And if I see you during the week, I know your name and I've got you down. But don't assume I already know your name. And definitely do this. My family... They're light years behind me right now on that. So when they get here, make sure you go up and say, hi, this is who I am. You know, and, and also, if you're a hugger, I will hug you, but I will extend the right hand of fellowship. So if you're a hugger, hug me, all right? But if not, and gentlemen, if you're like too cool for that, I'll extend the hand and then we can like do that man hug, you know? <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool, the hands there and the shakes there. So, and my family's the same way, but if not, it'll be a handshake, but if you're a hugger, let's hug. If, if you're a handshaker, that's all right. If you're the guy that's like this, okay, you know, and if you're the man hug guy, I'm totally cool with that. So, but let's, let's, let's start this off right. Let's get to know each other and really connect relationally. So when my family gets here, just be prepared. They're going to be like, I don't know who you are, so make sure you reintroduce yourself. And then you may have to do that for several months because my wife is terrible at names, so don't get offended if she just says, hey, you. All right? So with that, let's turn to the Word of God. I'm going to be all over the place, but have your Bibles open. Then Genesis 18 and Genesis 21 for today is the primary text. Uh, I won't get there for a while, but eventually I will. 
Today, we're talking about facing the unknown with the certainty of God's timing. We've talked about how we know God has called us, how God has a covenant for us, and now today, I want to talk about God's timing. Now, we like God's timing when it's good, don't we? Graduations. That's good things, right? New pastors, why you still like them, right? You know, we like those type of timing events. Family comes and visits. A lot of you have family in right now. There's a lot of good things. We like those type of things. And thank you, God, for those type of timings. When, when, we, when we get married or we buy a new home, somebody else bought a new home the uh, same time I am. Those are exciting times, and we like when God does those things. But God's timing doesn't always unfold exactly how we want it. And God's timing sometimes doesn't seem to come at all. And sometimes we get confused because we're like, I know, God, you want to do this, but why haven't you done it yet? And sometimes we take matters into our own hands. Say it isn't so. Anybody ever been impatient with God? By the way, he's got big shoulders. He can handle it. Grow impatient with God. Anybody ever tried to force God to do something like you get ahead of him and you're like, okay, God, come on over here and join me now? Come on. God's timing is a mysterious thing. And sometimes we, we get in there and we try to mess it up and we try to take things into our matters, but Ecclesiastes 3.1 tells us this, that God has ordained every season and every matter of time. Everything. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. God is in control of these seasons, God is in control of time, and God is in control of the timeline of your life. He's chosen the moment you would be born and the moment you will die. It's a mystery, the sovereignty of God, how it comes into timing and how we can grasp that. I'm still scratching my head about God's timing and bringing us here. It's kind of weird. You know, here in a couple months, I will have known Randy Morris for an entire year already. Wow. Really? Now, some of you are like, you just got a couple weeks with me. So it means he's not, he's going to dislike me before you guys do. It's okay. All right? <laughs> But no, seriously, the God's timing, how it worked out and how it folds. I would sit there and say, God, why would I want to move here? I got a senior in high school. Some of you have been asked, why would you have leave? And I, I, God bless you, those of you that have asked me this question. Why would you leave a good church like you had? And all I can say is God's timing, God's calling, God's covenant, God's purpose. And hear me now. Our lives have crossed paths for a reason on God's timeline. My life with yours, my family with yours, my life as a brother in Christ with yours as my family of God. God's got a timing thing going on, even though we may not see everything clearly and know everything he's going to do. Continue to hear the challenging questions. What are you going to change first? I applaud you and I thank you that you're eager to find that out. But every time somebody asks me that, I thought, why are they asking me that question? Are they afraid I'm going to stop their ministry or, you know, what's going on here? Are they trying to sabotage me in advance and figure out what it is and get ahead of me? I'm sorry, that's just my nature. But God's got something that we have to trust his timing on. And sometimes we may grow impatient. Sometimes we may get a little ahead of God. We're going to try not to do that, you all. We don't want to do that. Our job is to join God and let him unfold the things he has for us just as he's planned. Just like he changes the seasons. I'm kind of happy it's sunny and bright and warm. I enjoyed walking Solomon's Island, that little deck out there. Not as good as Ocean City's boardwalk, but it's still okay. I enjoyed the warm weather and no rain, right? Amen? You know, I, I enjoy fall when it changes and the crisp air and the, the leaves. And I, I can tolerate winter and your winters are nothing compared to the winters I've come for. So I think I'm going to really enjoy these a little bit better. I like spring with all the flowers. Don't they remind us that God is in control of time? From the very beginning, Genesis 1, didn't he? God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. He goes on to create the sun. He goes on to create the moon and the stars. He creates every time for you and me. He is timeless, yet he created time for you and me. Grasp that one for a moment. See, we're linear. We think linear. God thinks eternal. We have to start to look at these timing things from God's perspective and say God has something great eternally, not temporally, for us. 
So today, I want you to think of a scripture that probably all of us know, Romans 8, 28. God works all things for good for those who love him or are called according to his purposes. We know it, don't we? You claim it over your life every day, probably, some of you. God, I know I love you. I know you've called me. You're going to work this out for my good. But it goes on in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I want you to hear something today. Every single one of us in this room, God's timing is for you to become more like Jesus. If you have grown impatient with God, grow impatient with this, that you are not more like Jesus. I didn't see or hear a bunch of amens. I don't even know if maybe that went over your head. If you want to grow impatient about something, grow impatient with yourself, that you're not more like Christ yet. Because God says he predestined it, he foreknew it, that you and I are to be in the image of the God that he created back in the beginning, the image of his son, Jesus that you might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, we could add there, and those whom he predestined, he has called, and those who he has called, he has justified, and those who he has justified, he has glorified. Now, I want you to hear this. These very words go with what I've preached on over the last three times. What he has predestined, he's called. He's called you. He called Abraham. He's called you. Those who he has also justified. What did Abraham do? He believed in God, placed his faith in God, and God counted it as what? Righteousness. That's justification. And then glorification. Some of you may say, what is that? Glorification is something that will never happen while you live in this flesh and you breathe this air right here. Glorification is the process of where God will fully sanctify you and fully glorify you and you will be sinless. We won't experience that until we die and we have our new bodies like Jesus and we're in all of eternity with him. But that is what you are predestined to, glorification. Isn't that exciting? I looked back at my life and I compared it to Abraham and Sarah and I started thinking about this. How many times Abraham and Sarah had God do great things in their life and his timing unfolded and they didn't always get it. I thought, man, I can relate to that. I can think about how many times, you know, I'm sitting there, you know, wanting to get married, and I'm dating all these girls, and I couldn't see what would happen when I walked into ROTC class and I saw Shawnetta for the first time. God's timing. Couldn't imagine ever being a parent, although I wanted to be, and the first time holding Samuel and melting my heart. You know, don't tell him that. He'll never be the same if he knows that, Okay. <laughs> But you can see these things unfold, but I can also see God's hand in my life where he prevented things from happening, even when I messed up. Maybe you all never mess up. But you know what? God can even use our mess ups. God can even use that to bring about his timing and use our brokenness, use our sinfulness, use our human nature to even do great things. Because God says there, he, listen, he wants to work all things together. Last time I looked that up in the Greek, all meant all. You guys got to get used to that. That's my quirky sense of humor. Last time I looked up all things in Greek, it meant what? All. All things in your life, God works those things out. So, Abraham and Sarah, they're called. They have the covenant. Now listen to what they do. Between chapter 15 and 18, where we're going to pick up, they take matters into their own hand. They follow a tradition of their culture. That when a woman is barren, a slave girl can go in, and I'll make this PG PG, because I know kids are in here, all right? But sends a slave girl in to bear a son, a child, for Abraham so that it would be an heir to his throne. And they're thinking that's the promise of God. Because the culture meant that if Hagar had a child, which was Ishmael, by the way, that if Ishmael was born of the slave servant, of Sarah, that that would then become the child of Sarah and Abraham and would carry on the line of Abraham. And they saw that as what God's promise was. Were they right or wrong? Wrong. Now their intent was good. They were following their culture. We can't look at it and judge it from a 21st century perspective. We have to understand that that was common practice in that day. We have to understand that what Sarah was doing was thinking, well, I'm obeying God. And I'm going to make this happen. All right, come on now. I'm going to make this happen. So here we are. God's working with us. And Sarah works over here. And Abraham follows along. But they left God. 
And they say, okay, now, God, we know this must be what you want to bless because you told us you were going to bless us and make our name great, and you were going to make us a great nation, and you are going to let us have, like, stars of the sky and sea sands everywhere. That's what our offspring's supposed to be. And you're supposed to bless nations because of me, because of us. So it must be through Ishmael you're going to do that. <laughs> you know what God does when we make plans of our own? Go ahead, what's he do? He laughs. But we're going to see Sarah here in a moment laugh at God's plan. And by the way, then they're going to have a child and his name's going to be Isaac. Guess what his name means? He laughs. The laughter of God showing you I can do anything. Let's read about it now. Let's go to chapter 18. They've taken matters into their own hands, and then we're going to pick up here, and we're going to see something happen. God has to set the story straight, so verses 1 through 15 in chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him at the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth, and he said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and then go rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent with Sarah and said, Quick! Get three things of flour and knead it and make cakes. And then Abraham read, ran to the herd and took a calf and tender and good and gave it to the young man and he prepared it quickly. Then he took curds of milk and the calf that he had prepared and he set it before them and he stood there under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you after this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. They were advanced in years. The way of the woman was ceased to be with Sarah. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is, Lord is old, shall I now have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. After this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. May God add a blessing to his holy word. I want you to see a few things here. First of all, Abraham's following a cultural thing. He does not know who these three people are. And if you're reading it, I hope you've kind of figured out there's something different about these dudes. But here they do, he sees them out there and he runs to them and he does what's customary. He falls to their feet, he wants to bless them and, because they've come to his home. This is something that's been lost in Christianity, by the way. So I want you to hear, I'm going to talk today, even though the word is not used here because it's Hebrew, not Greek, kononia. Everybody say it, kononia. Get used to hearing that because we are supposed to share life together. What Abraham does is he falls at their feet, he blesses them, he wants to wash their feet, a very big custom, all the way through the day of Jesus. You'll see that Jesus was offended once when somebody didn't wash his feet. But then the woman came and washed his feet with her tears. And then also another woman came and washed his feet with expensive perfume. It was a big deal. Now, I know we don't do that in our culture, but what he's doing, he's basically saying, you are welcome into my home as one of mine. Because feet are kind of gross, right? Amen? You know, so washing another person's feet, that's a big deal. Then he does this. He doesn't wait around. He goes and gets the best food and gets everything ready and says, quick, we got to do this. We got to take care of him. And he invites him into the home and to the, underneath the, the tree and says, rest here. So he's treating him like royalty. And then this guy, these three start doing something. One of them starts talking like he knows what's going on. And one of them starts talking like, you know, Abraham, have you forgotten all the things I've promised you? Have you forgotten the blessings that I promised you? Back in chapter 12 in Genesis and then on to chapter 15 with the covenant in 17. Have you forgotten all that I said I would do for you? He says, where's Sarah? He knows Sarah. He talks about predicting something. How could a normal human being do this? He's known here as an angel of the Lord. And I want you to hear this. 
Whenever you hear the word or read the word angel of the Lord and he speaks as if he is the Lord, guess who he is? He is the Lord. Now, there's some other interpretations. That's mine. If you don't like it, get over it. I'm just joking. I love having theological discussions, but that's my conclusion. I believe whenever you hear that, because guess what? An angel will never steal the worship from God. Anytime you see someone vow to an angel, the angel will stop them. Look in the New Testament, read it. But whenever you see this, this is Yahweh. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. Get that terminology down. Jesus has always existed. He has not always existed in his fleshly form. This is where God has manifested himself in a human form before Abraham, and he's speaking as Yahweh, the Lord. This would be the pre-incarnate Son of God. Abraham saw Jesus before Jesus took on full flesh. He was there with the God-man in this moment, and he was speaking to his life about how he was going to bless him. Now, these other two guys, they're called messengers, we find out from the next chapter, and they go to Sodom. They were angels. So here is God. Here is two angels. By the way, Hebrews say we may entertain or fellowship with angels unaware. Abraham's experience, this grand experience of God is right here with him. The angelic beings are here, and he is konania with them. This is how we are to treat one another. This is how we're to relate with one another. And look what God says, Yahweh says, the Lord says, is anything too hard, verse 14, for the Lord? And then I like this, at the appointed time. I will return. She will conceive. She will bear a son. Wow. At the appointed time. What's that mean? God knew. God had a plan. God had a timing. And even though Abraham had grown impatient and Sarah had really grown impatient, they had taken matters into their own hands. God's saying, I have a better way. Lexington Park Baptist Church. I am not here and I will never talk bad about Pastor Mark. I will never talk bad about your past. I really don't, I say this in an endearing way, I don't care. I care in that we need to know and we need to let it go and we need to heal. Whatever's happened in the past, that's the past. Whatever mistakes maybe we have made, whenever we got ahead of God, maybe when we didn't join God, maybe when we didn't do things right, okay. Now everybody hold your fist up like this. Go ahead. Pretend you got a bunch of money in them. Okay, you got it? Nebel, you visualizing it? Nebel's like, yeah. Got a lot of money in them, all right? Got a lot of blessings in them. Got a lot of hurts in them. Got a lot of pains in them. Now, you ready? Do this. It's gone. It's your past. Can we do that? Can we let that be? Can we see that God's got things ahead of us? Can we see just like right here? Okay, God, I've messed that calling and covenant thing up a little bit here. I've gotten ahead of you a little bit here, and you've kind of set me straight now. We've laughed at you. Now, Sarah's embarrassed and she denies it, but God said, oh, no, you did laugh. And then I think it quite comical that God would make them name the son (laughs) Isaac. God will get the last laugh, you all. Amen? Our God has a sense of humor. Amen? We get like, oh, God's so serious and so tense. God has a humor. He created it. And he's going to laugh at them and laugh with them. And it's not to be a mockery. Guess what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the God of our forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the God that Jesus pointed back to all the time in the scriptures. They are the God of our ancestry. Even though we're not Israelites, we go back through the Messiah to them. God needs to remind us sometimes. Sometimes God needs to show up in our life in a very profound way, and he needs to intervene. Has God ever intervened in your life? Maybe more significant. Maybe some of you, maybe you were like an alcoholic and God intervened. Maybe the day of your salvation was so profound. Maybe you were living a life that was on a path of hell. And God literally, by the way, all of us were there. Maybe some of us worse than others. But God came and intervened, and he saved you. There are all kinds of things that God has done in your life where he intervenes where he wants to intercede on your behalf, where he wants to do what he did for Abraham and Sarah. Let's turn over now to 21 and see the fulfillment of this. 
verses 1 through 7. <laughs> the Lord visited Sarah. Just like he said, didn't he? When the time would come. Now in verse 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Sarah did conceive and bore Abraham a son in his old age at that time. God's timing. Of which God had spoken to them. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, and as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. She doesn't mean that as a bad thing. It's a blessing. God's laughter upon this. And he said, and she said, Who would have said that Abraham, that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his own age. God had a blessing to this too. So we look at this. The time in which God had spoken. God's timing. Did you know God wants to speak over your life? You know that God, listen, I, this is hard to grasp. If God knows every hair on your head, and those of us that have less than we used to, and God knows every sparrow that falls, surely God has a plan for each of us in this room. If God knows you by name, if Jeremiah was known before he was ever born in his mother's womb, if God knew that he would name Isaac, Isaac, if God knew at the right time that Sarah would conceive, if God has this plan back then, do you think he stopped? Do you not think in the 21st century that God knew Lexington Park Baptist Church would exist? I believe he did. I believe he does. I believe he's here. Just like he showed up with Sarah, he wants to show up here. Could you imagine every Sunday, because let me tell you what, this happens. The Lord shows up. I got one person that believes it. The Lord shows up. And look what happens. Miraculous things happen. Right? Man, can you believe a woman, almost 100, conceiving, giving birth to a child? Could you believe being a dad for the first time with your actual flesh and blood, son, besides Ishmael being half, if you will, because it's not the chosen. Could you imagine a 100 being a dad for the first time? Man, you're laughing. Can you imagine crawling on the floor then? Playing with all those toys? Dealing with the diapers? I know you guys have at least changed one, right? Amen? Wow. Wow. God can do anything. If he can do that, he's showing us, I am God. God wants to show up here. And he does every Sunday. We may miss him. We may not hear him. We may not see it. We may not feel it, but he's here. And we better start believing it and knowing that he's the unseen guest. He is the Lord of this house. Amen? Amen. He is here. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And I'm about to get going and start being like an African-American pastor. Amen. Amen. Got to calm down a little bit. You guys don't know me well enough yet. So what's that mean for me? 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the favorable time of God. Behold, now is the day of your salvation. Who remembers when that day happened to you? Now, some of you may have never experienced it yet, so I want to talk to you for a minute. The greatest thing of God's timing is that God sent his son to die upon a cross for you personal the world cosmos but it implies every unique individual being ever to exist in the cosmos Christ died for now I know if you're a hyper Calvinist you don't believe that but I hope you do everyone needs to understand that Christ's atonement was for all it's only applied to those who receive it though you cannot get to heaven through your parents you cannot get to heaven through any other being but Jesus Christ if you're in here there's a day of salvation that God wants to call your name and it says in the scriptures in Romans 10 that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved behold today may be the day of your salvation 
Now, some of you may question still God's timing. I'm going to go to Christmas. Do you know God predicted Christmas, not Santa? Did you know that? Do you know that? Listen to Galatians 4 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why did God do that? Because he had to send Jesus to do this. When we get to Romans 5, 6 through 8, we see this. For while we were still weak, in that moment of time, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you know we're ungodly in this room? The only righteousness that's in us is because of Christ. That's it. But while we were weak in that exact time, God knew and he died for the ungodly. And then we get to Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love for us in this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. That's personal, you all. Jesus really did that for you. Now, I don't assume that any of you are saved. Do you understand that? That's between you and the Lord. If you tell me you're saved and you can articulate salvation, I'm going to believe that you're saved, just like you should believe that I'm saved. And I know, and we need to have confidence in that and the assurance of salvation. But there are some in here that maybe have never done that before in their life. If today is the day that God has appointed this time for you, you may be visiting. You may be here, and this may be your first time ever in the sanctuary. You may be here, and you may have come a hundred times. You've never made a public profession of faith. You've never even made a private profession of faith. You've never put your heart on the line and said, Jesus, I need you. I give you my life. Thank you for dying on a cross. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. You've never done that before. Today, behold the day of your salvation. And if you have received that, you guys should be excited. Some of you look like you're about to fall asleep. Either I'm boring or you just really stayed out too late last night. You should be excited about what Jesus has done for you. You should never forget the day of your salvation and what God has done because he did it for you and he loves you and he's crazy about you and he's got a plan for you. So can we learn from Abraham and Sarah that God can do anything? Can we believe from Abraham and Sarah that God has a calling, has a covenant, and his perfect timing for each one of us in this room? And I don't know what all that means for all of us, but I know that God's got great things. God told Abraham, I have great things for you. And if we can tie back through the Messiah to Abraham, then God has great things for you and me. So right here today, with every head bowed, we're going to say a prayer. If you need to come forward in a moment and, and, and talk to somebody about, I, I want today to be the day of my salvation, then I'm going to invite you to come up at altar call if you need to be a member of the church. If today's the timing for that, many of you are here all the time, but you're not members yet. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe there's something on your heart. Maybe there's some issue you're growing impatient with. There'll be a Nebel and Joe will be up here with me. We'll pray with you and we'll help you through that. Father God, right now, we pause. We pause to wait on you. To believe and to dare to believe that we can learn from Sarah and Abraham so we don't repeat these same mistakes. That we can believe that you are great enough to have an everlasting plan for each of our lives. And that behold, salvation is in your very hands. And that you extend it freely. It costs you greatly, but you give it freely to us right now. May we rejoice in the day of our salvation for those of us that have you as our Savior and our Lord. May we rejoice with anyone in here, the wayward uh, person this day that may come forward and say, I want to begin this journey with you, Christ. Father, today, may you pierce hearts. May you open minds. May you prepare us to receive your timing here at this church. And may we be found obedient to you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.